My name is Eric Valenzuela. I've been in the post-production audio industry for 16 years. A few of the shows that I work on are Project Runway All-Stars. I do all the million dollar listings and a bunch of other projects. What we'll be talking about is quick time output for the audio mixer, AAF's OMF outputs, how to split out a show for a mix, a little bit about cutting and mixing dialogue, cutting and mixing music and effects, and then wrapping up a show. I'll let Curtis talk about what's uh, really helpful for us in the mix process. The big important thing when you're outputting a QuickTime is you wanna make sure your project is locked. There's nothing else that's gonna be happening. It is a bitch and a half to try and fix even if you provide time code. Also, the correct frame rate, super important. We don't want to have something that's 20 here on eight coming in at 29.97 and going, well, now everything sounds weird and it's off. I've had um, projects where uh, a guy actually tried to sync up his stuff and he was like, oh, everything seems to drift. So is it all right if I just cut it so that it's back in a sync? I'm like, oh God, no. I told him to have him send me it and it turns out he was shooting at true 24 as opposed to 23 on eight. And I'm like, yeah, so that's gonna cause your sync to drift. <laughs> just make sure whatever frame rate you were shooting at is what you're editing at is what you're sending us. Just consistency down the line. Start your quick time 20 seconds before, like a little bit of a leader beforehand. What's really important, if you can include the slate, if there is a slate card, because if we're asked, what quick time are you using? We go to the slate and say, oh, this one, the slate date on this is 12015 and oh yeah you're working on the right one or no you should have had you know a couple days later we could see from that slate you know which if we're using the right quick time and then after the last frame of picture I like it to go to black because in Pro Tools if you stop it on the last frame that's where it will stop and it will just stick on there so that way we can see exactly where the show goes to black and we'll cut out audio at that spot also make sure that the visible time code is from beginning to end I prefer it at the top center yellow or white with a transparent background. Output preferences? The preferred is H.264 because we can receive it really easily. It can usually be under two gigs, that's fine. It doesn't have to necessarily be 1080, it can be 720. Just something that's high quality enough so that we're not seeing pixelated mouths so we have to completely guess what sync is. That's really hard to work with. We can also work with ProRes, but as you know, ProRes can be gigantic and it's kind of hard to get back and forth. With uh, the latest version of Pro Tools 10 and Pro Tools 11, it can also understand DNX codecs because it has the Avid Video Engine engaged in it. There is also a codec called X264, which I've been given, that works and I guess X264 is based a little bit closer to what ProRes is. ProRes is best if we can, but honestly, H.264, if you have to pass it back and forth and work remotely, that's also really good. AFF OMF outputs, we we're talking about deleting unused files in the project prior to the output. If it's unnecessary, just take it out. That's best because then we just get these incredibly large OMFs that have a lot of unnecessary audio files and when we're splitting out a show we pretty much have to listen to everything to make sure that we're not missing anything so it just helps that um, helps the process along if there's anything that is completely unnecessary that it's just not included and if space is an issue when you're outputting um, like recently I get a lot of my outputs over the internet. Sometimes I'm, I'll get sent a one hour show as one big compressed file that's like about six or seven gigs. I, I would prefer to get it act by act because that way as it's downloading, I could just start cracking the acts that are already downloaded and then it just starts, you know, I could get the process of working on the show going a lot faster. If there's a problem after waiting four hours after you know downloading, if there's a problem, then I'd need a whole new output where is if I'm getting them act by act, I could just start working on some of the acts that didn't have a problem. If acts are too large and you need to split the act in half, I would prefer the act split from track. Like if let's just say there's 20 tracks, I'd rather have two OMFs or two outputs of 10 tracks each instead of having you split the act straight down the middle. If you give me 10 and 10 splitting it in two, I just put the two together, the show's good to go, that act's good to go, and that's really helpful. Now, when it comes to the naming configuration for each OMF, it's really incredibly helpful that you are detailed in the naming. Sometimes I get OMFs that just say OMF1, OMF2, with no name, no act, no anything, and it's just 
can, can get a little confusing, like not knowing is this the right show, is this the right episode. So it's just incredibly important for me that when I get the show that it has details, show name, episode number, the date it was outputted, the act number. And that way if I get a fix OMF or like let's just say, oh, there was a, a act that was changed and stuff, you know, you could put, you know, fix on there. And that way it just will differentiate, you know, what we're getting and that way there's no mistake. That Like the thing we're try I try to do is eliminate any guesswork because in, when there's guesswork, you usually guess wrong. And when you guess wrong, it's more work. Or it's wrong and, you know. People. If your show or if you have like a feature that doesn't necessarily have acts, another way that I've been able to take it in before is uh, with OMFs. You know, they have a two gig cap. So what you can do is you can just export a few tracks at a time, like one, two, and then export that and then unmute the rest and mute one and two and send those off. That sometimes works. With AAFs, if you just, uh, I know in Media Composer, if you just click the AAF edit protocol, and that allows you to go above two gigs, so they don't have that problem. If, if, you're, if you ever have a question, like you're not sure, just call. Yeah, email, call, send yep. something, just ask, ask us what we prefer. It saves us a whole lot of time as opposed to us guessing. You know, keep lines of communication open Absolutely. between all of us, you know. So this was a show that I recently got. The person that was prepping the show, the show was actually like 20 tracks, and he thought he could do me a favor by consolidating everything, and it didn't. What I prefer is if you can, when you're gonna send us a show, is if you could have primary talkers on top, any kind of secondary dialogue or responses below, and then below that, effects, and then below that, music. When I split out a show, I would never have the host and a responder on the same track. So I would do it like the top where I would stagger them. I was saying earlier, I recently got a show where I had 14 contestants and when I got the OMF, I had 14 tracks of audio going for, for one hour. Just They gave me every single mic and that just makes for a lot of digging. After I split a show out and I cut the dialogue, um, I'll know if I have any source requests. And that would be like a missing mic. Sometimes, you know, even here, like there might be a missing response or something or, or just a bad mic. I, I'll always ask for a source request if there's a bad mic, just in case, because like sometimes when they cut the show, maybe they use the wrong mic or maybe there was a backup drive with the log and they could find it. Anything that could help the show is best. Because when we come down to reviewing the show and the producer says, oh my God, that sounds horrible. And I tell them, well, yeah, you know, their lav was cutting out, so I had to use their boom. And they're like, no, no, they have, we have backup audio or whatever, you know. I could say, you know, yeah, we asked for it. They look for it, you know, you know, uh, I had the post-production supervisor sent her this email, you know. And my emails for source requests are very detailed. I'll tell them exactly who it is. Like, let's just say it's Mike's, Mike's lav. And, um, and I'll put exactly what words he says and I need because there might be an edit in there and they might not include the whole thing. So I, I'll tell them, you know, these are the words I need. You know, check to see if you have it. If you have it, cool. If you don't, just write me a short explanation of, you know, no, we couldn't find it. We looked everywhere. I could turn around and tell the producer, you know, yeah, we had, I sent a request. We looked for it. We couldn't find it on the backup drives. You know, we're moving on. And then they make a decision on, you know, I mean, pretty much at that point, you know, you either have to use it or change the scene. But most of the time, they just either use it or subtitle and, you know, they deal with it. As far as bad music edits too, like sometimes uh, editors will tie in music hits to, to picture and there'll be a, a bad edit in that, you know, a double beat before. If the main editor that knows, you know, if he could send like a little note along saying, hey, you know, I know there's a bad fracking bite here. You know, there's maybe a little music edit here that needs a little help. Um, there might be a, a place where they want to put a little bit of reverb on somebody's voice or something. You know, um, uh, we were just talking about how um, Avid doesn't uh, output those effects um, it'll just output the, the raw audio without the effect being on there. So if like you could tell us, oh, we would like a little rever reverb on there and stuff in the note, that would be really helpful. Or like what one of my editors does on one of my shows is there's this one line where the host always kind of yells out and they put like a little tunnel reverb on it and they like the reverb that they use in the Avid. What he does is after he outputs the OMF, he'll go in and just burn that bake that 
audio file and email that audio file to me and I just line it up and it's good to go. I don't have to like put any kind of or guess on what reverb or trying to match it. It's exactly what the producer wants to hear. I put it in and you know we're good to go. So like if there's like something that you really like, an effect that you really like, you know, you could output the OMF and then maybe output that effect as a, as a separate file and stuff that's already baked in with the effect. You know, instead of me trying to use a bunch of plugins to replicate what you guys did, you know, it's just easy just to throw it in and you know we're good to go. A, a mixer is like one of their primary objectives is to make sure nothing comes back from QC. I mean, that's my goal is for nothing to ever come back from QC. That's pretty much it. You know, and we watch the show down and we lay it back to tape and we watch it on TV. All right, well, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.